He says, Paul talking to Jesus, he says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of sin, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes from the feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the spirit of faith, that we can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is of the word, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that man, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication to all the saints, and then all saints for me. So as we begin tonight, uh, Paul is speaking to the church of Ephesus, and the particular reason, but it's also the events that went on in the church of Ephesus that we need to kind of lay some background. But normally, God is something that as I was growing up, you know, I was in a very different denomination, and it was taught to me very uh, differently than the way we want to look through the Word and how it's so tall as a companion of the Spirit. Uh, but it was to the point where the honor of God was frustrating to me, because, you know, if I didn't wake up in the morning, and I forgot to play it on when I was, you know, tempted, and I go out and uh, not be detected or receive all the blessings that God had for me. So that's what I want to focus on here. But in, in Ephesus, Paul was a, a church player. He had uh, come across the church to Ephesus, and Ephesus was uh, a, a booming town, if you would. They were a court town, and they were uh, big in one specific place, and it was idol worship. And they would make small trinkets, so and they would uh, even have witchcraft books and all these things. They were the spiritual community, but they were worshiping the wrong God. They were, they were just totally influenced by everything else because of the continuously uh, import of different cultures and different religions and all these things, much like America is today. You see this go on and on. And, um, you know, even the first Christians who went across, they, they were followers of John the Baptist, but they didn't really have the gospel down top yet. They, they believed that the Messiah was coming. They, you know, John had told them that Jesus was the one, but they, they were still a little misconstrued in the doctrine. So Paul said that uh, one of the first people we can learn is this Paulus that came first, and then uh, Priscilla and Aquila showed up, and they were, they were getting together the group, and the church was starting to grow a little bit, but Paul came in and said, hey, um, have you guys even heard that there was a baptism in the Holy Spirit that you know, the third person of that was the Paulus? We didn't even know there was such a thing. They prayed for them to be to become witnesses, followed by God's Spirit for, for that purpose. And then uh, a third thing happened. It was one of the more struggling church plants that he was to call. He, he, he didn't grow very well. Something in the synagogue he was not receive what he was teaching. So what he did is he became the first church plant in the school. He went up to college and said, hey, can I lay out the door to show him? He went up to school. So he was one of the very first church plants. Um, so he went up for two years in the school of theology to the uh, whole church. And then finally, something miraculous happened. Um, he was on, on his way um, to town and, and, and he just did a story uh, of how these would be kind of financially driven exorcists were in town and they decided, hey, well, we've heard about Jesus, we've heard about Paul's doing and what Paul's doing is the Americans behind him, he's even cutting up acres and things and he was praying for people that would go out and be healed. So uh, they were like, hey, we're going to get on this too. So they went and did the most astonishing thing that he did. They were going to find someone. Who spirit is that on the internet? And they went in and they said, Hey, we cast you out in the name of Jesus who called Jesus. And the spiritual thing looked at them and just said, Hey, uh, I know Jesus and I've heard of Paul, but I, I don't know you. Because they were not speaking the authority of being Christians, they were there from self doing. And it says it really beat the pants off and they spent them out naked as they preached. And then revival hit. Because all the people heard about what happened, and then this big gathering happened in the city where everybody was in awe of God, even the Christians even at this point says also that they were so in awe and that the name of Jesus was magnified that his name had true power. None of these little and idols and uh, books of witchcraft. There's no power behind this. This is, this is real power in Jesus' name. And so they brought all and had a big book burning in the middle of the street. 
And that's how the church of Ephesus was born. It just blew up overnight. Uh, but Paul has now just went away, as you learn that, and he's now writing a, a, a letter back because there's some still cultural things that are trying to seep back into the church. And he wants to say, look, you don't need to have a trinket that says, look, uh, I pray to Michael the Archangel to watch over me. That's not how this thing works. Or, you know, you need to pray something else besides the word and the name of Jesus in your life. Above that, it, it doesn't take us. That has seeped back in. So that's why he's writing this letter to them to, to give us the structure of the church and to remove this spiritual practice that's coming their way. Um, so, number one on your list here tonight, I want to open up with looking at verse 11. When I sit and he says, put on the whole armor of God. And this is very important to understand. And this G172, this is just a Greek definition. This is how you look this Greek word up. Uh, but the Greek word for this, it means put on. It, it talks about it's the sense of sinking into a garment. So what does it mean to sink in? Um, the first illustration that comes to my mind is a baby. So when a baby is born, what do they like to be dumped in? They like to be swallowed. They like to break it that tight. Why? Because it reminds them of the safety of the womb of the mother. That's what they want. They desire that. But eventually, they get to be toddlers. When they spread out, their arms go flying everywhere in bed, they take off the blankets, they throw the pillow outside the crib. Why does that happen? Because the trust is no longer just in the blanket. They know that any time they go to sleep, he's going to be walking around the country. They're going to constantly. So, what this is talking about here in number two, you guys, is the concept means that we can settle into and rest completely in the whole armor of God. This is very important. Um, but we understand verse 10 is very clear. It says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. So, we did this with a kid. It was very simple. See if we can get it her way. Um, if this says it's the armor of God, who does the armor belong to? Who does speak out? God. It's God. It's good. It's very simple. It's God's armor. Uh, it's, it's much like trying to put on something that doesn't belong to us. Saul and David is a perfect example of this. You have a teenage boy who's going to go out and fight Goliath. Now, it, it, I'm not going to turn to First uh, Samuel 17, uh, but just to give you a little bit of illustration, this this is a this is a teenage or tween kind of kid. I mean, he, he might, it says he was ruddy and handsome, but he's not a warrior. He's a shepherd. He looks after sheep. Um, but he's going out against a man who, it says his spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, that's a beam. Now, if you've ever seen the old-time weavers, they're, they're moving this large thing up and down, and it's, it's, it's not an easy task even laying on boards to move this thing. And he's carrying this thing around like a, like a spear. It also talks about how his coat of mail was not just something that just dangled there and was like 10 or 15 pounds. It, it was hefty. It was weighty. It was in the upper, probably closer to 60 to 80 pounds. And what it described was everything that he was holding from shield to armor to spear to helmet was a couple hundred pounds. Just, the, just him dropping his equipment on David would have killed him. Like it, It's that plain and simple. But David... You know, Saul was saying, look, you're going to go out and face this guy. You need to wear something appropriate. Let me put my armor on you. And, you know, I could see David coming out, and he's just covered in this. It says Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else, and David was, a, he was just a Jew. He was a short guy. So he's probably just, you know, the, the breastplate was probably down to his knees. He was, you know, the helmet was touching the shoulder pads of, of everything. It just didn't fit. It looked ridiculous because he was trying to wear something that did not belong to him. And that's where we can get in trouble is we try to yield or try to wear something that doesn't belong to us because we don't understand how it operates or how it's supposed to work. Um, so David, he stood against this massive Goliath, trusting in only what? God. He said, look, I don't care who you are, what you're made of, you have 
have blasphemed the name of the Lord God Most High. And I'm going to walk out because God is with me, and I'm just going to, I'm basically going to feed you to the birds of the air with your, your dying corpse. And this was only because he trusted in God, not in himself, not in Saul's armor, but the protection that went out before him. And it's easy to, you know, we preach the sermons, or I've heard them preach, um, that we are David, and we're supposed to go out and we're to slay the giant, and we're supposed to be that. And that's not the picture. The picture is David was a um, just a, a, a beautiful image of Jesus to come, that Jesus would eventually slay everything in our behalf. He would defeat Satan, hell, death, the grave, everything. David, uh, in that picture, was a picture of Jesus to come. He wasn't Jesus, but he was showing that. We, in turn, are the Jerusalem guys hanging out behind the tents, quivering in fear. That's who we are. But David was Jesus, walking out with full steps. Um, so, when we, are, when we allow ourselves to settle into the armor of God, we're talking about is we're settling into the trust that Jesus has done everything for us already. Every price, everything is already in pain, all the way to eternity. And that's what Paul gets this confidence in Romans 8. He says, look, there's nothing created, not Satan himself, not man. Uh, there's nothing in heaven, nothing on the sea, nothing on land. Uh, nothing can pluck me from his hands. I, I'm his. He, he uh, realized that. So, when he's the one writing this, when we pull that into context, we have to understand the confidence that he was in was in Jesus. That's when he stood up and said to everyone, look, you can have my work experience. You can have all the schooling. I was, I was educated by the second best guy in all the land. I had wealth. I had title. Uh, I've had all this good stuff. But man, when it's all said and done, let all that stuff fall away and I want to be found in who? In Jesus. That was all that mattered to him. I want to be found in Jesus. Him because he understood that he was his protection. Um, think about uh, Peter. What happened when he walked on the water? You know, he saw Jesus do it. And then what did he say? Lord, can I come out too? Can I, can I come out there? And Jesus said what? Sure, come out. Keep your eyes on me. Focus on me. And where did Peter mess up? He looked down. He looked away from Jesus and started to look, hey, I'm walking. I'm doing this. And as soon as that mindset happened to him, what happened? He sank. Just like a rock. That's why he's called Peter the Rock. And that might be a little bit of funny humor a little bit later on. Uh, but he sank like a rock, and he was Peter the Rock. So Jesus knew this was going to happen. But immediately, when he started to fail, what happened? Who swept down immediately grabbed him. His head didn't even go under the water. Jesus grabbed him. He pulled him out. So that leads us to verse 3 here. So understanding that... The way David walked out in the trust, the way Paul understood the trust, the way Peter learned about trust in Jesus, that if he says to keep your eyes on him to do it, this is number three on the list. The armor is a condition you live in. It is something that happens no matter what. We have to have our mind and our thought process focused on what the Word says about it. Um, so... If we understand that our focus has to be on Jesus, our mindset on the armor will greatly be heightened. So I want to look through the verses here for just a moment. So look at verse 10. Um, I'm reading from the King James in this version here. It just says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So this is number four for us. So the first thing that he tells us, he just proclaims it. It's about His might. It's about Him. It lets us understand that we don't do this. God does it for us. God protects us. God is over all of us. He sees everything. Um, so let me paint you a picture. You know, put yourself in a battlefield, and you are absolutely surrounded by the enemy in all sides. There's no one standing beside you. There's no one else there. And you have a shield that you carry in front. Because this is the most time we see this imagery of the armor of God. And we have this shield that we can protect, what? One side at a time. And then we have this sword. But if you look at the odds, eventually what's going to happen? You're going to die. You're going to get hit. You might last for a little bit on your own. You might block a few shots that are coming in. But ultimately, when they're coming in from all directions, from above and from the left and from the right and from the back, what's going to happen? We're human. We're going to get hit. We're going to be vulnerable. Um, so again, he's, he's saying, look, guys, in, in the church of Ephesus, be strong in who God is and His power, not yourself. That's not what he's saying. Uh, is anything about to do with we are the ones that are the soldiers going out in this capacity that we're doing all the protection. So let's pick it up in verse 11. He goes on to 
say that beautiful word, put on, just talking about settling or resting into the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So he, so this word stand is very important here uh, because he's going to go through this whole thing. He's going to repeat it three times. And we know in the Hebrew and the Greek, when they repeat things like this, he's trying to bring uh, prominence to it and give it power behind it. It's not that he has a stuttering problem. He doesn't really say in that language he's going to bring emphasis to that word stand in it. And again, it, it refers back to what he said before. When all is said and done, I want to be found in Jesus. And he's teaching this. This is where we want to be, is standing in this armor, and it will protect us against the wiles of the devil. Um, so this is number five for you guys here in verse 11. Jesus is our shelter. The psalmist writes about it all the time. We walk around in his protection. So we have a bunch of military guys in here. So when the shots are being fired and uh, the, the battle is at its, at, at its heaviest. Where's the safest place to be? Inside what? Tank. Inside a what? Tank. A tank? A bunker? Something that what? Gives you protection from all sides. That's where you want to be at. So, for Jesus, when the psalmist is saying, He's my rock, He's my fortress, He's my shelter, when Paul is saying, We want to be found in Him, Jesus is our shelter, and wherever we go, He follows us. That's why He says, Lo and behold, I will go with you always, even till the ends of the earth. He's comforting us that He's with us, He's got us surrounded in protection at all times. He is our shelter. And Paul is the same. In first attempt here, stand in that so it will defeat all the wiles of the devil. We will understand that we are in him. Uh, verse 12, we're going to say, So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the ages, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, Paul talks about in Corinthians that he went to the third heaven. I have no idea what that is, and I'm not even going to, I haven't heard any theolo uh, theologians that do a great job with that. But he went somewhere spiritually where God allowed him to see how things exist in the spiritual realm. And what he's saying here in verse 12 is uh, number six for you guys, that we have authorities working against us. Um, so how does the scripture describe the enemy of our souls? He's a roaring lion. Lion, right? He's a roaring lion. Um, and I've, I've talked about this before. A roaring lion is an old lion. Now, you see all the National Geographic shows. What does a lion do to its prey? It sneaks up on it in numbers. It's strong. It's powerful. It's, it's purpose is it wants to ambush and overpower its prey. But a roaring lion is an old lion that has lost its tooth. It has no bite in it. And what it has to do is it has to roar to protect itself from other predators, other lions from coming in and, you know, killing it. It's, it's getting to that point where it can't protect itself. So it's giving out lies, the signal of lies. That look, I'm stronger than what I am. I'm more powerful than what I actually am. Uh, but it, it casts fear. Don't, don't get me wrong. When you walk up to a roaring lion, you will feel it. You will shake. But you have to understand there's no power in it. It will startle you. Um, so that's what um, Paul is talking about here, is that we do have authorities that work against us in the spiritual realm. Um, but he wants to come in and give us this understanding of this truth. So go on to verse 13 here. He says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stay with me. To stand. Everybody say that, to stand. He's, he's repeating this for a purpose. This is the second time um, that he's talking about this. Uh, and what he's wanting to do is to show us the importance that we stand and we stay in this protection. We stay in the truth of the word. We stay in the truth of what Jesus has done. Because the moment that we get self-righteous and think that we're doing it, that our works are earning us our way to heaven, uh, or you know, even the misunderstanding that you know, God doesn't love us, or maybe I'm not good enough. Well, the truth is we are not good enough. But in Jesus, we are what? We are white as snow. We are new creations. That's what we learn in sin nature. We still have that working against us as well. Uh, in the first week that we talked about this, but it's important to understand those are lies. It's not the truth anymore, but they will continuously come. That's what Paul is saying. Stand in the truth of what I talked to you in the beginning, the gospel that I have given you. Um, number four, verse 14 goes on to say, Stand, therefore, having girded your waist of truth. 
This is the third time he's just coming in and saying, what you need to be doing this. This is the only way it's going to happen to stay in Jesus and what he's done for us. Uh, but he says, your waist of truth. So this is number uh, seven for you guys. So the belt of truth. Now, we're going to put two uh, statements here. See, I want you to asking yourself this question because once we, we expose what Paul is wanting us to look at here, um, the truth is, Jesus did this. The lie is, the enemy wants to run outside the bunker and be totally defeated. Uh, but that's not what Paul is wanting us to do. So we have to self examine ourselves inside about what do we really believe. So the first one here is happening for you is for the belt of truth. Do you know and believe God's word? So remember, believing is very important. You can know something but not believe it. You can know a random fact, but not actually believe it. And the difference is, if I know by a shadow of a doubt, the road is dark, and I wear a pitch black black clothes, and I go out there and I lay down in the middle of the road, what's going to happen? I'm going to get my number. So what do I do about that, knowing that there's actually a danger there? I will put what? Light clothes clothing. I will make little bolts flash all over me. I will make sure that my kids are very aware of the dangers of the road. So when I believe something, I don't just know it. I take precautions. I give action to it. So when we talk about the belt of truth, do we not only know the word, but do we believe it? And this gets down to the root problem. Do we need to confess this? Lord, I'm having a hard time with your word in this area. Will I openly expose that so I can understand where not only am I vulnerable to attack of the enemy, but God's saying, look, I want to strengthen you in it. Test me. Know me. Come to realize this is the truth. Because if we don't have the truth of everything, that's what holds the centerpiece together. That's the beautiful part about it. And I gave some scriptures here that you can read on your own time and just continue to ask this question. Do I believe God at His Word? And that's why it was so important when we talked about the covenant in Genesis 15. Uh, as we'll show in a minute, why the word is so believable. Why it's so important because his name is in the line, right? No, it's God. He put his name on the line. His reputation is on the line for us because he loved us. Um, the other half of verse 14 is going to say, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So this is a great for you guys. The breastplate of righteousness is the question that we have to ask. Are you certain you are covered by the blood of Christ? How many struggle with that sometimes? You are covered. And that's, that's an ongoing battle. God gave His Son, His only begotten Son, so that whoever believeth in Him will, will not perish. That's a key part. Will not perish. And what would the enemy like to be more than anything else? Is it killing? We love the kids. But we're saved. We can't. I mean, we can physically take us out, but we're going to have eternal life. But what does that cause? If we have fear that somehow I'm still unforgiven in area, even past, present, or even future sin, like Romans 8 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That's past sins, present sins, and things that we even know that we're going to commit. We have already forgiven for that. But if we don't believe that we're forgiven, what will we do? We will become complacent and passionate about the gospel. Not because we don't want people to know about Jesus, but we don't believe what? We're good at the sin of the gospel. But somehow, he didn't cover it. And that's important in the sense that we are certain that we are covered because Jesus, he knew we were going to be missed. He knew we were going to fail and miss. He miserable at the end. But he came anyway and said, I know all this, and yet I'm not just in you. That's important to understand. And so Paul gets across this. And I heard the king of the world that says this. People, they take people outside the walls for a show of power. But this to ultimately take away the manhood of anyone else that was there. They would strip them of any ability to guard or to protect themselves. You couldn't always do it. You know, you couldn't do these things. You didn't have the right to protect yourself. You were a Roman slave. You were a 
hopefully going to be a Roman citizen if you could try to all the uh, desires one day, but ultimately you were a Roman slave. So when Paul is driving this to everyone, and not only did the Jews, but now the Gentiles, they, they were also taken captive by the Romans. Imagine the picture of saying, look, God is wanting to restore to you what everyone else stole from you. What everything else is stripped to you of, and you're just exposed to the world, God wants to come in and comfort you again, so you need to be able to keep it, you need to be safe again. So what a visual picture of how he's describing this is what God's doing. He's restoring that, and this is just what Rome is taking from you, but more importantly, this is what the devil takes from us, and we're doing the God, and so all of this from us, and he's putting it back to God. So he says, and how does God speak with the preparation of the gospel of peace? The gospel gives peace that comes from what? All understanding. Men don't understand it. Wait a minute. I, you know, I can help it for that. I, I can see I can get saved, but are you telling me that the murderer or the rapist or the child molester, all these guys, you know, are you going really to tell me that there's actually forgiveness for them too? That's a hard to swallow. And all of us have either known somebody or have been hurt by others. And that is where we just, you know, that's one of the main things that God's been here with us. I don't want to get the place for your neighbors. I don't want to get the place for your enemies. I want to get the love of your enemies. I want to go after them too. And in this area, when you want to go after your enemies, when Jesus comes and says, you know, you take them back to you, you drive them out of the country, and you can stop them from the beginning. This is number nine for you guys. Um, the feet of the gospel of peace. Can you explain sin? Well, we came the first week, we came now. Why we must die, God's forgiveness, and our resurrection in Jesus. This is the gospel. Can you just properly explain it to someone else? So don't get me wrong, this sounds crazy. But we have to believe it. We have to understand it. And it will stop for us, it's for those who are perfect, but for us. And they came to know him. And that's what it's about. So they explain that in such a way. And it's not hard. That's the way. Well, I'm talking about this. So we were talking about this. So we were talking about this. Hey, this is how we are. This is how we are. This is how we are. Hey, for all those who don't lie, raise your hand. So actually raise your hand. And he said, you're all lying. Because we know you are. And so he said, you know, it's fine. And that's, just, and that's been the, the, the key thing that Paul always tells us throughout Scripture and one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And I'll tell you about Paul's because you have to get people to understand their sin before they can get to the And you have to be able to explain that to them. And I love that he gives us, like, uh, we, we talk about it in the Scripture, it, it, it's like getting your feet. You know, I, I, did, I didn't know where I was going with it. It's Jesus. I want you to go. I'm going to cover your feet with the peace of the gospel. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. It all comes back to faith. And, and you know, I, I put some little pictures on the side here for you. And we think of the shield of that, you know, it covers one side. And I have to turn it. And, and the kids, are, I, I was talking about this, and they got it really this way. I'm like, Jesus is that bunker. When the psalmist talks about, he's a fortress, he's a rock, he's, he's everything. He covers you in all directions. This little illustration of the shield um, is probably the best one that we have for him. But you know what they said? Jesus is a fortress. He is the best. I don't even know what's going to happen. And that's it. If we can understand, Spiritually, that's what protecting us, even when we're asleep. Because I used to think, man, if I didn't wake up in the morning and pray, I'm like, so you just tell me that at night that I don't have to do anything at all, or they fell off. And so that's how I was taught that we had to wake up and clean up. And what Paul is saying, no, wake up and remember and rest in it that you were taking care of yesterday, and today you're spiritual. No matter the circumstances you're going through, no matter if you're busy like Paul was, or if you're busy like he was, or if you're rich like he wasn't like that, or if you're busy like he was, 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 or
and so you can address the spiritual protection that is needed. This is number 22 days. The field of faith, the important question when we learn about the covenant. All God does for us, He does for all for His name's sake. We understand that. But this is His name on us. It's His promise that we get to rest to Him. He's the one that does the work for us. Uh, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. And this is number 11 from the other side of the page. The helmet of salvation, you have to ask yourself, are you confident that no power for us in your name can trust you from the sky? I love that verse. And that's what Paul's going to do. And you know, he went to a tough camp or a tough progression. At one point, he called himself in the Christians, I'm the, you know, the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the 12 that you know, Jesus is going to I'm now number 13 and kind of odd speak out. And then, you know, they started to finish this up as he was sinner. And by the time he was all said and done, the more he grew closer to Jesus, what did he say? I am the truth of the gospel. I am the man that Jesus did for me. And when he still did for me, the Lord is very strong. Because he knew that I knew that the Lord was his name was the Lord for me. But he was confident that my faith was what he did. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So, this is this is interesting. You know, we oftentimes we open the Bible and we think the word of God is black and white letters on the page. And there's the, that's the form of it. But we have to understand what is John proclaim Jesus as. He is the word. He is it. He lives it. It, it. it becomes living and active. When we talk about, um, you know, our, our gospel going out in the book of Mark and we're studying on Sunday, who's it going through? It's going through us to do the ultimate soul. It's Jesus. Jesus is doing it through us. He's, he's letting the gospel go out. He's letting the word of God go out through us. It lives. It brings because it is Jesus. So when he's referring to you, take up the sword of the Spirit on how Jesus did do the work. It's, it's active in us. And that leads us to number 12 through us. The Holy Spirit. We rely on the deed. We rely on the living word of God to change your life and expect it to be the agent of change in others. That's the prophet's call has. We kept coming back to the word. Think about in, in Ephesus, two years, and the church didn't grow at all. And if you look at the stats in American Day, if the church hasn't grown in two years, very much church like this. It's just a bit of a shock. Which is what? They don't believe the truth. When Jesus told Peter, hey, if you proclaim me, that knowledge only came from the Father. And he says, if you continue to proclaim that and that alone, that you this came, this revelation came from God Himself, that Jesus came to us, that I'm the only way to truth in life, what did He say to him? I will build the church. He said, Peter, you'll build the church because of the program or because of the outreach or anything else? No, he says, you proclaim me, I will be the rest. So, man, how many more churches if we can just pay off? So, what the hell is coming? I'm going to do the big church. He'll stay with the Holy Spirit. That's all to us. He will be the rest. So, again, he's He's the change of our lives, and it's just going to be the easy of change of life because it's living, breathing. The word is Jesus. Verse 18 goes on to say, you know, a lot of times we skip this one. Everything else that I saw online and the illustrations, they always have the others as the armor of God, but he doesn't skip this one. He says, praying always, this is so important, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We are called to have consistent conversations with God. Why? It brings us back to the truth. When we go to Him, when we have that relationship with Him, if our salvation is based on nothing else than a relationship with His Son, how important is it in the whole armor to bring that back to actually having a relationship with Him? Let Him be living and active and breathe in you and help you to realize it's still about him. It's never about us. Um, so, as we finish here, I have two thoughts here on your page. So, I put a little picture here of David uh, on the right. That was the little illustration that he had. How awkward he must have been in that armor. You know, it didn't fit right. 
I'm going out against a man who's three times or four times my size and has never been defeated in battle. And, you know, I'm guarding sheep. And, yeah, I've had some success with lions and bears because God delivered them at that point into my hand. And then it clicked. If God did it then, in these circumstances, why would He not do it now when His name is on the line? When we think of gathering stones, it's not Pastor Dwayne's name on the line. It's not Jeremy or Jim or whoever it might be, Phil, Jenny, Doug. It doesn't matter. It, that's not whose name on the line. And we're glorifying Him and we're promoting Jesus through the Word and teaching. All these things, it's about Him. He will grow it in His time. And it has been a beautiful growth process the last year and a half. I mean, we, we, we are full on Sundays. And what was it a year and a half ago? Four to six people. It is a beautiful thing. And have we done anything fantastic? Yeah. Yeah, we love Jesus. That's the fantastic part. That's it. That is it. It is about Him. And and think about the relationships. Like we, like I'm just amazed when Jesus calls it, and the, and the writers call it, the body of Christ, the family of God. That's exactly what it is. We fill each other's weaknesses and burdens. And man, it's a beautiful thing to be able to call out and know that other people are walking with Him and going through the same things. It's, it, 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 we're, we're all at the feet of Jesus. So this is number 14 for you guys. So remember that battlefield scene that I painted earlier with it kind of looks below down with all those swords every direction arrows in every direction is your faith in something you put on yourself that's an important question because if it is you're going to have fear you're not going to go where God calls you to you're not going to withstand the test of time not that you're not going to get saved but it's definitely going to affect your witness you're not going to be an effective witness like Mark, what we learned about on Sunday. It will hinder that. God can still use it and do what He does because He's God, but we want to be an effective witness. So that leads us to 15. Now put your uh, picture down there on the, on the right. Now take you out of the equation and let's ask this question. Or is your faith in the warrior Jesus who defeated the powers of Satan, death, hell, and the grave? Now, if our faith is in Him, that's a totally different understanding of what the armor of God is and how it operates. And Paul says, don't be caught outside of it. Three times he's preached over and over again. It was a one-point sermon that he turned into a three-point sermon that says, stand in, stand in, stand in the armor of God. And it's Jesus. That's who he's describing. Stand in what He has done for you. Let's pray and then we'll spend some time together in fellowship. God, we just thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for these foundation classes. But sometimes, you know, we get prideful and we, we think that somehow we're now doing it. And I, I think what Paul said, we're foolish to waste them. And we get that way sometimes. We bewitch them. How did we get from understanding that it's faith that saves us, but now we're being perfected by something that we do? So God, I pray that we would have that understanding, that we would know you in such a way um, that we would just fall deeply in love with you like that little baby who understands that mom and dad are just walking around and they're sick and they can just rest. doesn't mean we're not active in the gospel and proclaiming it. As far as the spiritual battle, as far as what happens in our salvation, as far as what happens in the next person's salvation, we can give all that to you and do what you call us to do and have to stay the good news of what you've done and let it rest on that. And God, we thank you for building the church. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the family of God. And we just stand back. And this is a testimony that the Word is true. The Word does what it's supposed to do because it is Jesus. It's more than just black and white letters on a page. It is the very living breath of Jesus. And God, I pray that would just be still in us. And Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.